Thank you. Um, I should say that it's actually quite intimidating um, to be the one standing between such a, a large group of people and their lunch, um, so I am uh, determined to try and get us there uh, as quickly as possible. Okay, so uh, UCL Press, a new model for open access university presses. Um, so to give uh, some background, uh, we did actually exist in a different form uh, back in the 1990s. We grew to over uh, 100 books published per year in a fairly sort of traditional university press way, uh, with a staff of around 15 people. Um, but then we were bought by Taylor and Francis, um, but the imprint lapsed. Uh, and this was actually seen as a, as a great opportunity uh, for UCL, um, not only uh, to have its, its press back on campus, uh, but also because open access had become such an important part of the university strategy in the interim period. Um, so it made sense then when the uh, when the imprint was bought back in 2013, that UCL Press would become uh, the first fully open access university press uh, in the UK. And so we launched in June of last year, so we're just coming up to our, our first birthday uh, next week, in fact. So I will quickly go through the institutional benefits. I think Graham did a, a really good job um, of laying the foundations for this. I've already mentioned one, uh, the fact that we are uh, an open access university press, so in that way we do reflect the wider interests of the university. Um, but here's one, uh, worldwide dissemination into countries where print books are unaffordable or out of reach. I think that mostly refers to the open access um, side of, of what we do at UCL Press. Uh, extending the influence of the institution, um, so we're very proud in showcasing the research that's being done at UCL as well as uh, elsewhere. Uh, we support research from inception to publication, so we very much see our authors as our colleagues at UCL. We can offer a very personal face-to-face uh, -face publishing experience. Uh, we can publish research that has no commercial value but does have a wide audience, again probably relating more to open access. I think it is really important that we remember research does have an, an educational value as much as a commercial value, of course. Uh, we publish student work, so we have a number of student journals that we host on um, OJS, the Open Journal System, uh, and we also provide career assistance for students who want to work in publishing. Uh, so we work very closely with the MA publishing course at UCL um, to offer the students their internships if they want to find out a bit more about what it's like to work um, uh, in publishing as a career. So the setting up process, um, I've tried to condense this to one slide. Um, of course, lots of things happened, um, but for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to run through um, the key um, stages. So first is UCO had to decide on the model. Um, they already knew that they wanted an open access model, um, but then we know that there are lots of different open access models, um, consortium model, freemium model, and so on. Um, but UCL decided to go with um, a subsidised university press um, model. I'm sorry, Graham, for using the word subsidised, but it's, there aren't really any others, really. Okay, so this, uh, so we are directly uh, funded um, from UCL, and this enables us to waive all of the fees for UCL authors, uh, and we do charge a BPC or an APC uh, for non-UCL authors. If a UCL author wants to collaborate with a non-UCL author, then we do waive all the fees. Um, likewise, we have a, a waiver scheme um, for those authors who really do want to publish with the press um, but are unable to raise the required funds. And we also have a, a waiver scheme whereby non-UCL authors who want to contribute to uh, uh, one of our book series, then they can do so without needing to pay a charge. So all of our books are available as free PDFs on the day of publication. We are a gold open access publisher, um, but then we also have a POD model um, for the paperbacks and the hardbacks, and we try to make sure they're for sale at affordable prices. Um, there's clear demand um, from authors, at the very least, for the physical copy, so we're, we, we say we're very happy to continue printing the books as well. Staffing, that was also um, an important stage, so Lara Spiker, the publishing manager, was recruited first, and then she, in turn, recruited a production editor, a marketing manager, and then me as the commissioning editor, so that we have four permanent members of staff, and we also have an admin assistant working with us at the moment on a temporary basis. Uh, so Lara sent out the first call for proposals. That was two years or so ago. Um, and since then, we've had about 160 book proposals um, from all across UCL and around 20 journal proposals. And they are journals that are both new uh, and flipping um, from the uh, subscription model to, um, to open access. 
campus meetings. So again, Lara in the early stages spent a lot of time traveling around the campus, meeting with researchers, um, uh, deans, heads of departments, um, to advocate for the press. Um, and now that's what I spend a lot of time doing, traveling around the campus, meeting with researchers, um, and advocating not only about the press, but also open access. Of course, there are many questions that, um, that, that still come up um, about um, the you know, sustainability uh, and so on. Okay, so to go into uh, the publishing activities, so what it is we actually do at UCL Press. So I've put some of our book covers um, on a slide. They are books that some are published uh, and some are due to publish. Uh, we've published 12 books um, in the last uh, 12 months, um, but we're hoping to get up to 20 um, by uh, the end of this year, and then we'll be publishing 30 to 35 next year. So hopefully then by the end of 2017, uh, we should have a backlist of, of over 50 titles. Um, that's the plan. I've included one of our um, journals here, AMPS, which is Architecture, Media, Politics and Society. So we do have a number of journals. They're all open access uh, and they are hosted on Ingenta. And I've also included um, a textbook, the textbook of plastic and reconstructive surgery. Uh, but we do have a burgeoning textbooks program. Uh, this particular textbook, which publishes uh, next month, um, has been developed alongside the JISC initiative um, that aims to find out if institutions can actually publish um, their own textbooks. Okay, so seeing as it is an, an electronic publishing conference, I thought it, it would be good actually to run through um, our platforms. So we are currently developing three platforms um, with a company called Armadillo Systems based in London. And this first platform is currently live, so I'm actually going to go on our websites and hope that I can actually show you um, what the enhanced digital editions are. We have two books on this platform at the moment. So we have the Petrie Museum book and Treasures from UCL. They were two of the books that we launched with last June. Um, and what we really wanted to do is give the authors an opportunity to do something that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do with the print edition um, or with the PDF. So if I click on this link, I'm hoping that it will take me to the website without too many problems. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is our website. Feel free to, to visit and, and say all the books are there to, for downloading. Okay, so if I go on, say, the Peachy Museum. So you've got the download free uh, link, which takes you to the PDF, the buy paperback. So this one's £10. And then we also have a link here for the enhanced uh, edition. So that's what I'm going to show you. So this is what it looks like. As you see, it's a fairly sort of user-friendly interface. It's not actually the whole book. Um, it's just aspects of the book that we thought would lend themselves to um, this style of publishing. So instead of chapters, we've actually just got a, a range of headings here. Um, so if I click the link to have a look at the introduction. So you see here that we have um, an, an introductory video um, by the author. Uh, we have maps. You can zoom in. And, Pretty good quality. Likewise, um, this fabric here. Um, uh, there is a lot of text um, from the book, just to make sure that all of the audiovisual content is fully contextualized. Um, so scroll down a bit further, for example, a few images. And then another video of, the, um, of a weaving process, which I'm sure you agree is a very difficult process to um, describe in words or even in uh, still images. So hopefully that it's a very quick run through, but hopefully it does give you a sense of, of what the, the, the uh, digital editions are like. So we've got two on there at the moment, and we're, of course we're always looking for others that we can, that we can add uh, at a future date. Okay, so moving on quickly to our second platform, which is actually called Book, um, Books as Open Online Content. And this is a term that was coined by the leaders of the Academic Book of the Future project, which you might be aware of. Um, it's been investigated at UCL and King's College London. So the idea is that the platform is actually called Book, and then the first book that we'll be uploading to the platform is the Academic Book of the Future. 
Um, so with this first book, what, what we're trying to do is really create a repository where all of the work um, that's been submitted to the project um, can be collated. Um, so you probably can't see too well, but we have um, the key headings, um, peer review, selling, publishing, open access, editing, and digital university presses. So all of the content will be uploaded and organized under those headings. Um, all of these tiles uh, represents a piece of content, and that can be absolutely anything, video, podcast, audio, Storify, a traditional article. So any way in which a contributor wants to submit something um, to the project, the platform should be able to accommodate it. Uh, there is no um, print equivalent, so there's no point at which we're going to have to stop and try and figure out how to publish this in the, in the traditional way. It's purely a digital initiative. And it's also live, so um, we're actually going to be uploading um, the content in three batches. Uh, the first batch is being prepared for uploading at the moment. Unfortunately, that's why I can't show you the platform. Uh, and then the second batch will be uploaded uh, in August, and then the third batch uh, in October, when the Academic Book of the Future project um, begins to wind down. At which case, uh, so at which point we'll probably debrief and then decide on, on another um, project that would be suitable for the platform. One that's ongoing and ha has a lots of um, audio-visual content. That's, that's really what we're looking for uh, for this particular platform. OK, so last but not least, um, we have our monograph platform. And again, I, I, it's in the testing stage. It's due to go um, live uh, very soon, the next month. Um, but I've managed to get a link, so hopefully I can show you what this is. I should say that this is in addition to um, the print and the PDF. This isn't replacing anything. Okay, so this is where all of the monographs will be uploaded. We have some of them already uh, uploaded. Hopefully, they won't take too long to appear. Okay, so here they are. So say if I want to have a look at social media in an English village. Um, okay, so the idea with this is that readers can actually work with their personalized version of the monograph. Um, so they can log in. Um, it is the whole book. It's not like the digital edition platform where it's just aspects of the book. Um, it's the whole book. You can see that the table of contents is there. And, and here are all of the tools. So there's an export tool, bookmarking, a notes option, um, a highlighting tool as well. Uh, and, and the reader, the user, can, can use the monograph um, and save the copy. And then when they log in again, then it will be there, um, ready to be used. Um, in terms of the benefits to the authors. Um, so uh, say if I wanted to have a look at this um, chapter, which is about the glaze, which is the, the village where the uh, research was undertaken. And you can see that the author, in this instance, has taken some photographs of the type of residences, properties that you would expect to find um, in this particular village. And what we're really looking to do is get to a point where, instead of an author feeling like they have to use photographs, the author, in this instance, could have actually just had a video tour of the town or the village um, with an audio commentary. So as we begin to publish more from the digital humanities and engineering and architecture and so on, um, those sorts of disciplines where authors are using animated graphs and tables and, and maps and diagrams, um, I'm really hoping that that's where this particular platform um, will really show its worth. Uh, OK, so uh, just to conclude, um, uh, I think that it is possible for an institution to establish its own alternative uh, to the, tr the traditional model of publishing by repurposing its budget. Um, that's what UCL has decided to do. It seems to be a model that works for UCL. Um, but of course, there are other models that would work better for other universities. Uh, we think that the benefits to doing so can be substantial. Um, I'm hoping that we have been an asset to the university over uh, the past year, and, and we will continue to be so. Um, it's very difficult to measure the success of a, of a non-commercial entity, um, but we've had some really great reviews for our books, both in terms of the content and the production values. Um, and we've also seen some very encouraging downloads. Um, so I think that proves that at least that we're, we're sort of on the right track. And last, um, I think it's important to remember that OA presents an opportunity for institutions to reassert their role as providers of public knowledge. 
if you look at the, the mission statements of many university presses, they refer to trying to sort of reach outside the academy um, to, uh, to the, the public and to the taxpayer. Uh, well, we're very keen to try and reach those readers who don't have access to a university library, but are nevertheless are very interested in the, the content that we're publishing. So thank you very much. So thank you for your talk. It's great. I mean, I'm of course interested in what the budget is like, but I'm going to ask you <laughs> during lunch. So this is up to you. If you raise a lot of questions, you don't get anything to eat. If <laughs> no, I'm joking. So if you feel like asking questions, go ahead. The lunch is there, and it makes sense that not everybody is jumping at the buffet at once. So you can decide to stay here and ask questions or queue up on the stairs. And if nobody has a question, then what is the budget? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I, I, I dare ask. But, uh, yeah. Alenka has a question. Uh, hi. I'm curious, um, how, can you, how can you demonstrate that you, uh, you said, extend the influence on the institution? I think this is also crucial. We also heard in the talk of Graham before. But I wonder, how, do you say have set goals, how you were actually spend the influence? Um, no, I don't think that we have set any goals. Um, I think that, um, I mean, we do monitor our, our downloads as, cl as closely as we can, um, and it's quite clear that we're, we're reaching countries, you know, over 160 now. Um, and I think it, it, it's probably fair to say that in, in some of those regions, they probably wouldn't have engaged with much of, of UCL's um, research, particularly in certain disciplines. Um, so we've had you know, a great response to a couple of our books in very specific regions of Africa, for example, or, or Asia. Um, so uh, in a sense, that, that's working on the assumption that, that we are extending the reach of the university, but of course that, that is just an assumption. We don't, we don't know that for certain. Um, it, it's very difficult, as I sort of alluded to, to monitor our success, I think. <laughs>